Kate Hale's How We Became Posthuman, and in particular the prologue to it, offers a different, uh, offers a distinct approach for thinking about how it is that information and communication technologies are embodied, complicit, embedded in contemporary performances of the body, contemporary performances of gender. A couple of essays that might be useful as background for thinking about what she's saying is on the one hand, Alan Turing's essay, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, source of the so-called Turing Test, published in 1950, and John Searle's Minds, Brains, and Programs. He's a philosopher. He published this in 1980. And it's a famous critique of AI, which says that strictly symbolic manipulations don't uh, tell us a great deal about intelligence. <clears throat> So in the prologue to How We Became Posthuman, Kate Hales offers a reconsideration of the so-called Turing test. And what it says about gender, this is taken from Alan Turing's Computer Machinery and Human Intelligence in 1950. What was the Turing test? A quick recap. In the mid-20th century, Alan Turing is trying to figure out how would you know if a machine could think? And he says, well... We think that humans think, so it needs to design a kind of experiment that challenge humans and machines to perform a similar kind of task, and then judged by the performance of that intelligence requiring task. And we need to find a way to do it that leads us not to discriminate between the human and the machine simply because we know the machine's a machine and so on. So he comes up with an experiment. He says, well, we could have a judge who sits at a computer terminal, or really a printout because it's 1950, and asks questions through this terminal, through this interface. Answers come back. And the judge has to guess if the answers come from a human or a machine. So the, the, the measure of intelligence here is sort of to trick the judge into thinking you're a human. If he can tell the answers are coming from a machine, and the machine isn't intelligent. There's a variation on this test. Uh, it's the test that Hales has in mind, which says, perhaps you have a human, probably a man, and a machine trying to convince the judge that they're a woman. So the judge asks questions that based on the way their answer should tell you something about the gender of the person, you know, giving the answers. And the trick here is to have uh, the computer perform as well as a human and probably better than a human in producing answers that are not just plausible as answers from a human, but also plausible as answers from a woman. And if the computer can perform as well as humans or can perform better than humans, well, then the computer has intelligence. And the key here is the measure of intelligence is not some absolute fixed quality, but it's relative. Intelligence is something we identify with humans. We see if humans can do something in the same way and, you know, performing strictly symbolic tests, performing strictly cognitive operations perform a task as well as humans. So why is it that Turing has, in this one variation of the experiment, the computer imitate a woman? So there's a standard answer to this measure of human intelligence, which says that Turing wasn't really concerned about gender per se, but that was just a kind of random or ill-formulated aspect of the experiment. He just was trying to test different ways of performing humanness. And gender was seen as one dimension of humanness. Hales offers a different explanation of gender in the Turing test. Hales says, actually, what the Turing test shows us is that there's a kind of unstable boundary between embodiment and gender. She writes, what the Turing test proves is that the overlay between the enacted and the represented bodies is no longer a natural inevitability, 
but a contingent production mediated by a technology that has become so entwined with the production of identity that it can no longer meaningfully be separated from the human subject, end quote. What does this mean? Let's break this down. <clears throat> For Hales, the Turing test is actually about exploring what is humanness, what is intelligence, when bodies are taken out of the picture. And when bodies are taken out of the picture, suddenly gender and sexuality becomes a new dilemma. When we're all interacting through machines, when we're not dealing with each other's bodies, we have to judge each other strictly on performances and on representations, not on our actual original embodiment. And Kate Hales is saying there's a reason at the origins of digital culture, at the origins of digital computing, when people try to think of what a machine does, uh, if a machine is intelligent, that they come upon the question of can a machine pass itself off as a woman? Right? Because suddenly identity, sexuality has something to do with enactment. It has something to do with representation. It's not grounded in flesh and blood. Okay, it's symbolic. It's mediated by technology. And identity itself is performed and defined. Sexuality, gendering, is performed by its mediated presentation in technology. That's what Hales is saying. So Hales is saying that the Turing test shows us not so much a great deal about intelligence, but it tells, it tells us something about the changing relationship between bodies and gender in an age of ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous machines, networked communications. So what does this really mean? What's at stake in this? <clears throat> in one sense, Alan Turing's Turing test could be seen as part of a longer history of how it is that media technologies break down familiar forms of embodiment. Okay, Donna Haraway has some very important examples of how it is that our relationship to our body is thrown into question, open to modification in an era of cyborgs. Marshall McLuhan has these celebrated ideas of how it is that the body um, is, let's not say manipulated or modified, but certainly its dimensions, its natural properties change when confronted with communication networks, uh, reflections, representations, and so on. Turing is part of this longer tradition of rethinking the body in reference to information and communication technologies, in reference to media technologies. On the other hand, one of the things that Hale's analysis seems to suggest is that the identification of intelligence strictly with symbols, well, it does seem a little bit problematic. Is it fair to say gender or identity or intelligence or the self are strictly a question of communication and information and flows and representations? If that was completely true, then we wouldn't need bodies at all, right? And so Hales wants to explore the possibilities of rethinking gender in an era of ubiquitous communications. But she also wants to interrogate, to critique, to think about the problematic aspect of simply saying, we are what we perform, we are what we communicate, because that would sort of suggest that all of our bodies are unnecessary. And she sees in that a kind of ethical catastrophe. <clears throat> Hills writes, here at the inaugural moment of the computer age, the erasure of embodiment is performed so that intelligence becomes a property of the formal manipulation of symbols rather than inaction in a human life world. So she's saying that with the rise of digital computing, Intelligence starts becoming strictly a question of symbolic manipulation because that's what machines do. That's what computers at least do. They manipulate symbols. And she's suggesting the human life world, human experience, human interaction, involves other forms of performance 
that need to be taken into account. She argues also that the history of information theory, the history of cybernetics, throughout the history of computing innovations, there's this, I, there's this attempt to identify information with mathematical patterns and probabilities that loses sight of embodiment, loses sight of bodies, and as such, will always be radically inadequate to the conditions of human existence as long as it makes that uh, misconception. In a way, this fantasy lives on today in the dreams of uploading our minds to machines. <clears throat> One place for thinking this through further is uh, Ex Machina, the 2015 film. Ex Machina offers a very contemporary and recent effort to think through the Turing test, to think through whether or not bodies matter. And there's actually a very interesting video essay, critical analysis of this um, film in video form, available at fandor.com. Here you see a link to it. And with that, uh, one can see how some, some of the debates, the utopic, the fantastic, the factual, the scientific aspects around the Turing test have continued in the, you know, in the decades since Hales wrote her primary essay. <clears throat> 